spent most of the time on the Old Testament. So uh, we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord our God, we give you thanks and praise for the blessings and gifts that you've given to us. Help us to come closer to you through your word. We ask this, as always, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The other day, a friend of mine from Steubenville came to visit and brought me a bunch of crazy stuff. He always brings goofy stuff. And in the goofy stuff that he brought, he brought some tracks. Um, and this track is called Rome versus the Bible. So I thought this might be interesting to look at this as we begin on our group thing tonight. And it starts out and it says, what would you do if you found out that many of the teachings of Roman Catholicism stand directly opposed to the Bible? Would you choose to believe in the word of God or the words of men? It is impossible to believe both. The Bible teaches scripture has authority over the church. Catholicism teaches the church has authority over the scripture. The manner of interpreting scripture is ultimately subject to the judgment of the church, to the pope, and to the bishops. The Bible teaches that man is justified once by faith, because justification provides a permanent right standing before God and results in glorification. Catholicism teaches that man is justified repeatedly by sacraments and works because he loses the grace of justification any time he commits a mortal sin. The sacrament of penance offers a new possibility to convert and recover the grace of justification. At least he got that right. The Bible teaches man is regenerated at baptism of the Spirit. Catholicism teaches baptism of water, which is a sacrament of regeneration. The water of baptism signifies our birth into divine life. The Bible teaches that man is saved by God's unmerited grace. Catholicism teaches man is saved by meriting grace needed for salvation. The Bible teaches man is saved for good works. Catholicism teaches man is saved by good works. Therefore, they attain their own salvation. They don't need Jesus. The Bible teaches man is saved for all eternity. Catholicism teaches man is saved only until the next mortal sin. And those who die in a state of mortal sin are descended into hell. The Bible teaches that salvation is offered to those outside the church. Catholicism teaches salvation is offered through the church. The Bible teaches that all sins are purified by the blood of Jesus. Catholicism teaches some sins are purified by the fires of purgatory. The Bible teaches man becomes a saint when the Spirit baptizes him into the body of the church. Catholicism teaches that man becomes a saint only if the Pope canonizes him. This occurs when he solemnly proclaims that they practiced the heroic virtue and lived in fidelity to God's grace. The Bible teaches every Christian is a priest and a member of the royal priesthood. Catholicism teaches every man needs a priest for salvation. Catholic priests guarantee that Christ is acting in the sacraments which are necessary for salvation. The Bible teaches the Lord's Supper is a memorial. Catholicism teaches the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and offered in an unbloody manner. 
The Bible teaches that believers receive Jesus once, spiritually, in the heart. Catholicism teaches Catholics receive Jesus physically, frequently, in the stomach. The body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus is truly and really substantially contained in the Eucharist. Um, these teachings of Roman Catholicism demonstrate how the traditions of men nullify the Word of God. True saving faith is granted by God as people hear and believe in the Word. Eternal life can be received only as a gift of God's grace through faith in Jesus. Accordingly, we must come to the cross of Christ with empty hands of faith, leaving everything behind except our sins. There you have it. This is put out by uh, Proclaiming the Gospel Evangelist Mike Yendron. Planto, Texas. Some of the stuff that he said was a third or a fourth true, but much of the stuff is typical misunderstanding of the faith and misunderstanding of what the scripture is. For some of those fundamentalists, they sort of believe that God is the author of scripture, and somehow, some way, he wrote all the books of the Bible and gave them to us. And so salvation comes to us through the Bible. It's sort of interesting. We haven't had the talk on the history of the church. I don't know when that is. I think Father Christopher's given that. In the history of the church, Anybody who believed that Jesus is God was called Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. And so anybody who believed that Jesus is the Son of God was a member of the Catholic Church. There weren't these other groups and sects. In the year 1254, when power switched from Rome to Constantinople, the, patriar the patriarchal bishop of Constantinople got the bright idea that since when power was in Rome, the bishop of Rome was in charge and was the head of the church, well now since the power of the world is in Constantinople, he's the head of the church. And so there was the break. There was a break. And the break wasn't really very much about theology. The break was because the Bishop of Constantinople wanted to be in charge. Now that's not the way Jesus set it up when he made Peter in charge. But that's what the Bishop of Constantinople wanted. And so when he broke away he kept the sacramental life of the church, but he didn't keep union with Rome. And so the church that he established is called the Orthodox Church. Some of those people have come back. They're called the Uniates. They reunited with Rome from whom they, they broke. And then in the, in the 1500s and in the 1600s, because of problems with um, communication and with some other problems, we had the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation started, and this isn't bashing anybody, the Protestant Reformation started basically with Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. And Martin Luther was scrupulous. Scrupulosity is an awful thing. Because scrupulosity means it's a psychological problem and they think somebody who's scrupulous thinks that everything they do is a sin. My primary example, when I was first ordained I was in St. Peter's Church in Stewartville. 
And there was a lady who used to call as many as 25 or 30 times a day. And I remember one night I had the, and, and priest, she called every priest in the student building, they'd get mad and hang up because it, it, it was nerve wracking. But one night I had this couple in, and we're, they were filling out marriage papers. So the telephone rings. And I said, Good evening, St. Peter's. And this voice always said the same thing Is this Father Campbell? Yes, the <laughs> Yes, this is Father Campbell. Are you you're sure this is Father Campbell? It doesn't sound like I said, this is Father Campbell. Well, Father, would you answer a question? I'd be happy to. Is it a sin to drink water before you go to communion? <laughs> so I said, the last thing we studied in the seminary was that it's not a sin to drink. You can drink water on your way out if you have to. <laughs> Thank you, Father. And these people are kind of looking at me. <laughs> Hung up. Not a minute later, the phone rings. The evening St. Peter's. This is Father Campbell. This is Father Campbell. I'm the person who called. I mean, I know. I'm the person who <laughs> called you and asked you about water. You said it wasn't a sin to drink water. But when I drank that water, I thought it was probably a sin. So therefore, I committed a sin, and I'm going to go to hell. You're not going to hell for drinking a glass of water. It's okay to drink water. It's fine. You're good. You're okay. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Two minutes later, she calls back again. I couldn't tell you before, but I'm the one who drank the water. And I thought to myself, should I get the glass of water from the bathroom sink or from the kitchen? And I deliberately got it from the bathroom sink as it was closer. And that's disrespectful. And so I lied. I said, it doesn't matter where you get the water. You can get it from the commode if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and this couple was in the middle. <laughs> I'm sorry. So then we hung up. And she called back again. I forget what she wanted. So I said to her, I said, why don't you? I got to help these people. I said, Tell you what you need to do. You need to forget about all this stuff. It's nice outside. Take a walk. Okay. Five minutes later, the phone rang. I've committed a grave sin. You ordered me to go for a walk. I said I would go. I disobeyed you and did not go and didn't intend to go. I am going to go to hell. You're not going to go to hell because you didn't go for a walk. I don't care whether you go for a walk or not. I just need... 20 minutes so I can talk to these people who think you're crazy. <laughs> That's scrupulosity. Martin Luther was scrupulous. And Martin Luther was so scrupulous that when he would have mass, the mass was in Latin, if he would mispronounce a word, he was an Augustinian monk, well, if he mispronounced a word, he would think like mass was almost like magic, and he'd have to start all over again. And so it would take him sometimes four or five hours to have mass. So the poor thing was really desperate. And on top of all that, maybe somebody was trying, maybe this nun was trying to give him consolation and keep him calm. But he falls in love with this gal, and he's going to leave. And so he has all these conflicts within himself and with his gal, and so he decides that he's going to leave the church, and he's going to keep some of the things that the church has, but he's going to start his own. So he puts these 95 theses, and he you know, writes them all out, and he puts them on the church's word. And so he starts his own church. And what he did, because he would have such a difficulty in having mass, he said, in our service, we're going to cut out the second part of the mass. The mass is divided into the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. We're going to cut out the liturgy of the Eucharist, and we're going to stress the liturgy of the Word. And then he said, 
anybody can interpret scripture any way they want. They don't need the church to do that. And one year later, he was directing all these ministers who were with him and the people, and he was saying, there are as many <coughs> interpretations of scripture as there are people. This is nuts. You don't know anything about the scripture. How can you even read it? And so all of these groups started up, and they were, uh, they were a, a result, basically, of just emphasis on the scripture. Where did the scripture come from, and what is it? You have Bibles. We talk about the Bible as a book. The Bible is not a book. It looks like one, but it isn't. The Bible is 73 books. The Bible is old, divided into two. The Old Testament, all of the things that happened from the beginning, especially of the Jewish people's relationship with God, up to the birth of Jesus. And then the New Testament involves all of the things that happened in terms of the Gospels and the life of Jesus and events in the early church and letters from the apostles and uh, uh, leaders of the early church. It wasn't until the year 300 and 97. It wasn't until the year 397 that the Pope called an ecumenical council. An ecumenical council was, it, it was it's convened by the Pope and all the bishops of the world are summoned to come to this council. And the work of that council was and we have all these writings and all these books from the Hebrew scriptures and in terms of the New Testament. And what we're going to do is we're going to go over them. And we're going to invoke the Holy Spirit. And we're going to figure out the ones that are really inspired by God and written by these human authors. Because in terms of the scripture, we say that the scripture is a divine book. It's written by God. However, God, as a pure spirit, cannot write a human book. He needs a human author. It's like, if you want to write something down, you have to have a pen or you have to have a pencil to write it. And one of the popes wrote an encyclical letter called Divino Aflante Spiritu, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and in this letter, he gave the analogy of the pen. And the analogy of the pen in terms of the scripture is that God is the author of the book, and so he, but he needs a human author. And so he's limited by what the human author knows and understands. But he can still inspire that author so that what is written is truth. If I want to write in blue ink and all I have is a red pen, if I want to write, I'm going to be stuck. I've got to write in red. I'm going to want to write in green, and I have a blue pen. I've got to write in blue. So God uses the human author, and he doesn't give him any super extra knowledge that he didn't have before. And so the author sets out and begins to write. He determines what he's going to write, and the Holy Spirit inspires him as he makes decisions about what he wants to write, so that what is written is truth. I'm going to shut up, so we're going to look at some of this stuff. We're going to look at, uh, let's open our Bibles to the beginning. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. And usually every year when school starts, they have this, you know, somebody down south is hooting and hollering because they're going to teach evolution, they, they can't teach evolution or whatever that is. So we're going to look at the first uh, book of the Bible. And you might be surprised to know that there are two creation stories, not one. 
And you might also be interested, maybe you're not, but you might be. The first story of creation, Genesis chapter 1, was one of the last things that was written in the Old Testament. And it was written during a time of, called the Babylonian Exile. What happened in the history of Jerusalem, in the history of the Israelite people, is they were sort of hot and cold in terms of their relationship with God. Sometimes they'd obey the commandments and sometimes they wouldn't. And when they wouldn't, disasters came and the prophets would warn them and all this kind of stuff. So at this one point, the Persian Empire was in power. And the, per and the, and the Israelite nation was very weak. They were not worshiping God. They had fallen into false worship and pagan worship among all these nations that surrounded them. And so the Persian emperor came in to Jerusalem and he divided the people into three groups. This group, they're slaughtered in the streets of Jerusalem and killed. This group stays in Jerusalem amid the rubble and all of the horror of Jerusalem. And this group, the intellectuals, the artisans, the priests, they had to march 500 miles to concentration camps in Babylon. They weren't the kind of concentration camps that we think of with Dachau and Auschwitz and Buchenwald. They were just taken to Babylon and they were forced to live there in ghettos. They were treated rather well. But some of the beautiful psalms that we have in the scripture were written while they were in the exile. And this first chapter of Genesis was written there. I'll tell you why after what we look at it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was a formless void. There was darkness over the deep, and God's spirit hovered over the waters. Do we have any art teachers here? Good. <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to see my drop. <laughs> this is water. This is water. This is all water. Okay? So we're going to we're going to take this literally and see what this says. There was darkness over the deep, and God's spirit hovered over the water. God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So God creates light. God saw that the light was good and divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening and morning came on the first day. So the first day is light. Why would you need light? Did you ever try to do something in the dark? I mean, you can't do it. If it's totally black, you can't do it. God is like, this is called the Yahweh, is the author. God is working. He's a Hebrew workman. And he's going to go out and create. So he's going to work. Well, he's got to have light. So on the first day you create light. Doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Then God said, let there be a vault in the waters to divide the waters in two. And so it was, God made the vault and it divided the waters above the vault from the waters under the vault. God called the vault heaven and there was evening and morning on the second day. So what does the sacred author think? There's a vault over the earth. It's logical. There's water, there's the sea. It rains sometimes. The vault keeps all this water from coming down, but sometimes it rains. How would that happen? There has to be like little gates up here, and God opens the gates, and boom, we get water. 
<laughs> so he creates the bulk on the second day. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and fruit trees, bearing fruit with seeds inside. And so it was, the earth produced vegetation, plants, bearing seed in their several kinds, trees bearing fruit with their seeds inside. God saw that it was good, and evening and morning came on the third day. So on the third day, God creates trees. This is an apple tree. <laughs> it creates trees. Now remember, you have the light. You have the bulb, and now you have the trees. This makes a lot of sense. Then God said, let there be lights in the vault to divide the day from the night. Well, how can you have, if he's already created lights? But on the fourth day, he creates light. Let them be lights in the vault of heaven to shine on the earth. And so it was God made the two great lights. The greater light to govern the day, the smaller light to govern the night. So he creates the sun. How's it, where, how are you going to be with that? It's hanging up here like on a little string. <laughs> and he creates the stars. Twinkle, 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 little stars. They don't blow down, so they're all hanging up there. This makes sense in other things, too. And you got the moon. <laughs> and so it was... Uh, there was evening and morning on the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters teem with living creatures, and let the birds above the earth uh, fly within the vault of heaven. And so it was God created the sea serpents of every kind, and he saw that it was good. So he creates these birds, and he creates Joel. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite movie. Then God said, let the earth produce every kind of living creature, cattle, reptiles, and all that kind of stuff. So then God creates all these, the cattle and all that. This is... That's... <laughs> either a horse or Molly the dog or whatever that is. <laughs> then God said, let us make man in our own image, in the image and likeness of ourselves. Let them be masters of the of fish of the sea and birds of the land. God created man in his image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, saying to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, be masters of the fish of the sea and all that. Then there was evening and morning on the sea. So he creates mankind. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their array. On the seventh day, God uh, completed the work that he had been doing, and he rested on the seventh day after all the work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on that day he had rested after all the work of creation. Such is the origin of heaven and earth. is the first creation story to tell us that this is the way the earth looks and this is the way God created it. And then he creates light before he creates the sun and the moon and all that stuff. It doesn't make any sense. Scientifically, would you accept this? If you do, you're kind of nuts. This is not what the earth looks like. I saw a picture of it from the spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't look like this. But that's not what the author is teaching. What the sacred author is trying to teach is God has the power to create. And he did it. But what's even more important that he was trying to teach, especially the people of the exile, God rested on the seventh day from the work that he had done. You people in the exile never rested on the seventh day. 
you stopped giving worship to God on the seventh day, you stole and lied and cheated people on the seventh day, that's why you're in the exile. So get your act together and start worshiping God. That's what the first story of creation is about. It's not about that God created in seven 24-hour periods. It doesn't have anything to do with that. And then there's the second story of creation. Uh, don't panic, we're not going to go through the whole Bible tonight. Now <laughs> <laughs> you're getting nervous. The second account. At the time when Yahweh God made the earth and the heaven, there was a, yet no wild bush on the earth, nor had any wild plant sprung up, for Yahweh God had not sent rain upon the earth, nor was there any man to till the soil. However, a flood was rising from the earth and watering the surface of the soil. Yahweh God fashioned man out of dust from the soil. Then he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and thus man became a living being. What do you see? God uh, is standing in the middle of nothing, and this water comes up that he has ordered. Water comes up and makes this big muddy mess. So God then becomes the fashioner of clay. He gets down on his hands and knees and he takes all of his muck and he puts it all together and then he forms man and then he gives it and you know, breathes into his nostrils. He gets down to his own artificial whatever. And then God plants this garden in Eden, which is in the east. And he puts man there to fashion it. And he caused a spring to come up from the soil. And it produced every kind of tree and all that kind of stuff. Everything wonderful. And then God creates all these animals and says to Adam, you know what, you're in charge of the whole mess. But Adam wasn't happy. And so then God says, I, you know what I think I'll do? I'm going to now become a surgeon. And so he casts Adam into a deep sleep and performs surgery. He removes one of his ribs. That was the original spare rib. <laughs> <laughs> he removes this rib and he fashions out this rib to eat. And then Adam wakes up and he says, Whoa! Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> and they had a wonderful relationship, Adam and Eve and God. They would walk, Scripture says, in the coolness of the afternoon. That was the intention of God for mankind. We were to be one with him. We were to be his friends. And that was a sign as, as they have him walking in his garden. And since, again, the Hebrew mentality was a desert kind of a people. They experienced, or they wrote about this Eden, like a garden. It was refreshing with streams and trees and birds and flowers and all kind of stuff. And then God says to Adam and Eve, you know what? Because I love you so much and you are so good, it's all yours. You can have it all. You're in charge. However, there's one thing I don't want you to do. I don't want you to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That doesn't say anything about an apple tree. When I used to teach this in high school when I was the first ordained, I would tell the kids and they'd look, you know, I would say, it was not the apple in the tree that caused the problem, it was the pear on the ground. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so what Adam and Eve were told was that God created them and all of us with a free will. And he wills that we would accept him fully. But Adam and Eve said, They were tempted by the evil one. So they're walking in the garden. We're going to move off of this pretty soon. This is chapter 3. The first 
the fall. And again, the, the intelligence of this sacred author who wrote this, he looks around and sees sin in the world, and he says, where did that all come from? How come people are so dead on rock? The serpent was the most subtle and cunning of all the wild beasts that God had made. When I was in the seminary, we had to, that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of nuts. There was this priest who lived across the hall from me. First thing he had was a cockatoo. Bird and two little. And um, this, there was another one. This priest was from Poland. He would come in with a pencil, I guess, and he would poke this poor bird. And the poor bird would, you know, crap all over the And then this priest decided that what he, the bird was getting sick and scrawny, so he decided that this bird should have, you know, be put in the shower and turn on the water, not smoking hot, but hot so that it's like steamy and it'd be like South America and so the bird, you know, I mean the priest was nuts. So the bird died. <laughs> then he got a boa constrictor. Oh, no. Noah the boa. So he called it Noah the boa. Now, this made a lot of sense because we all wanted to pass this class. I had it for church history and for uh, uh, what else? Church history and patristics. Anyway, so we'd have to go in on Friday before lunch. And he would take a live mouse and put it in the cage. And the cage was just almost as long as the table. And the, they put this mouse in this cage. This Noah would be all one end, all kind of curled up. And this mouse would go in, it, and the mouse was aware that there was something there that was not going to be good for him. And they'd kind of shiver and run all around, sometimes even on top of this snake. And this thing wouldn't move, except when the mouse turned its back and that tongue would, and that tongue would come out. And after that thing, and I'm not making this up, this is true, after that thing was in, in the little mouse was in there for maybe 10 minutes, and this, the head would come up, and it would come down and just... Was the end of the fourth act. Cunning. Sneaky. Most people don't like snakes. <coughs> I, one time somebody put one, a garden snake in my bed at the seminary and they were watching. When I went in and opened the door and the snake was there, I screamed and ran and ran out the door, ran down by the lake and they came running out. I'm sorry, we didn't know you were there. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the beginning of the stints. Okay, so all these people around Israel worshipped pagan gods, and some of them worshipped snakes as gods. And so the sacred author, in trying to have this individual, this tempter, the devil, as a serpent, was getting his little dig in to these pagan religions to which some of these people fallen into. And so the serpent was the most subtle of all the animals that the God had made. And he asked the woman, did God really say that you were not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we can eat the fruit of all the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat it or touch it under pain of death. Then the serpent said, die. God knows, in fact, that if you eat it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God's. And you will know good and evil. And she said, hmm, yeah, give me some of that. And so then she gave some to Adam, and he very willingly and happily ate it. And then God comes along, because it's the coolness of the afternoon, and he says, why are you guys? Well, we're over here to push it. Well, come on out. Well, we can't. Why can't you? Well, we're naked. Well, who told you you were naked? You must have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, he curses the serpent, and he
and he speaks to Adam and Eve. And he says to the woman, I will multiply your pains in childbearing. You shall give birth to your children in pain. Your yearning shall be for your husband, and yet he will lord it over you. So it wasn't supposed to be that way. To the man, he said, because you listened to the voice of your wife and ate from the tree of which I have forbidden you to eat, accursed be the soil because of you. With suffering you shall get your food from it every day of your life. It shall yield you brambles and thistles, and you shall eat wild plants. With sweat on your brow, you shall eat your bread until you return to the soil as you were taken from it. For dust you are, and into dust you shall return. Death. Death was not part of God's plan for us. So the next time some friend of yours dies and you go to the funeral home, do not say something stupid like in trying to console these people. Well, it was God's will. Oh! God does not will suffering and death. It is contrary to his nature. Then, um, God curses the serpent. And he says, I will put enmity between you and a woman, between your offspring, Adam and Eve, sinful mankind, and her offspring. And he will crush your head as you strike at his heel. It's called the first good news. The pro this is called the Proto-Evangelium. The first good news, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Somebody's going to come and reverse what just happened with original sin. And so the rest of the Old Testament explains and looks forward to and points out who the someone was going to be. The first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, are called the Pentateuch, Penta meaning five. The Jewish people would you know, believe that they are the books of Moses. That Moses actually sat down and wrote them along with God. Moses didn't do that. It took over 1,500 years, or at least 1,000 years, to write the books of the Old Testament. And the whole theme of the Old Testament, if you want to kind of like find a theme for the, of all the books put together, the whole theme of the Old Testament would be that God loves his people. And so, as Adam and Eve turns away from God and he makes this promise that somebody's going to come and reverse what happened with original sin, God's plan unfolds. And the unfolding plan is that someone is going to reverse what happened with original sin. To begin the plan, God chooses a nation. He could have chosen the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all these important nations. Instead, he chooses a group of wandering nomadic people who had no leadership, and who were totally disorganized and calls them. And he calls them through a patriarch by the name of Abraham. And he takes these people and what he does with them is he says, you are the most unlikely, the most disorganized, and the dumbest group that there could possibly be. Therefore, the Messiah is going to come through you. I will show my power. And that's what happens. In the Old Testament, there, the most important book, the heart of the Old Testament, is the second book, the book of Exodus. The rest of Genesis talks about um, sin and suffering, and it tries to answer the question of what, what were these natural disasters. 
we know, for example, that there was a terrible flood that hit the area that the Jewish people lived in. It's also described in a Babylonian story called Enuma Elish, and it talks about this horrible flood. Well, in the book of Genesis, there's the story of Noah. Noah is this just man, but he's about the only one because everybody else, again, after they were called by God, they know the true faith, but they're worshiping all these other gods, but Noah didn't, and he had several sons, and they were good too. So God is all mad at everybody, and he's, he said, he calls Noah. Do you ever hear of Bill Cosby's thing on Noah? I used to put when I was a teacher at the Catholic Church, I this. Noah, what? Who is that? It's God. Come on. Noah, it's God. What do you want? I want you to build an ark. What's an ark? It's a big boat. What am I going to build a boat for in the middle of the desert? Just do it. And this is how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be so many cubits long and so many cubits wide and so many cubits. What's well, a cubit? And then what he's supposed to do is he's supposed to get two of every kind of animal. Now why would they have to do all that? Because if there was this horrible flood and the known world was destroyed, and yet years after there are still animals, that obviously there was somebody who was saved, and he obviously saved the animals, and so that's why there's animals. So in the scripture it talks about Noah being just, calling the people to be just. Noah was part of the remnant. In the Old Testament, one of the themes is the remnant. There's always a few, like 10% who's going to remain faithful to God. The rest of them can all go to hell on roller skates. But the 10% are going to remain faithful to God. And Noah and his family was. And so God said, you're going to be saved. And so you get on this boat and you've got all these animals and I would be happy to draw the boat. When I grew up in high school, I'd draw this little thingy after me and say, what's that for? Said, That's for the skunks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then after all these, 40 days and 40 nights of rain, Jesus spent 40 days in the desert before his public ministry. Forty. What's the big deal about forty? Forty is a perfect number for the Jewish people. And so forty was complete. It took forty days. It was just enough time for all this rain to come. And things needed to be done. Jesus spent just enough time in the desert to prepare for his public ministry. So in that story, they're trying to answer the question, why was there, why do these ter terrible disasters come? Because man turns away from God. That's the answer. Is that true? Sort of. Also then, and, and see what they're trying to do in Genesis, is they're trying to answer the question, why is, are there, is there so much sin in the world? Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve, they turn against each other. Cain kills Abel. So murder enters the world. So sin constantly grows and grows and grows, and God gets tired of them. Then they build this, they build this uh, um, tower. They build the tower. And their idea is that they're going to force God communicate with them. Now, is that, it's in the scripture, is it true or not? Probably it is. They were building a Babylonian ziggurat. A Babylonian ziggurat is like a pyramid that you could walk up the pyramid and steps on it. And at the top, they would build an altar. And the priests and the people would go up to the top of the ziggurat and they would demand that God would come to them. 
They would offer sacrifice, and God would have to come to them. Well, they build this tower, but the tower is destroyed. And then, you know, the Tower of Babel. And they're also trying to figure out how come there's all these different languages. Well, God then, when the tower, well, they're trying to build this tower to tell God what to do. God said, well, I'll fix you. You're all going to have different languages, and you're not going to know who's talking about what. It's up there together. And so the languages are confused. Did God really do that? I don't know. It doesn't matter. What matters is that mankind was again trying to control God. We don't control God. God controls the world and invites us to accept him. So my little friend who wrote that doesn't really have a clue about what we really believe. Look at this introduction to this scripture. A lot of times people think that Catholics don't know anything about the scripture. Well, a lot of them don't, but we're supposed to know about the scripture. We had the Vatican Council a uh, couple years ago, and one of the great documents that came from the Vatican Council was a document called Divine Revelation. And it spoke about the importance of the scripture, reading the scripture, so that the Bible isn't meant to be a book that you keep on your coffee table, and when Gertrude dies, you write her name in there, and when Junior is baptized, you write his name in there. We're supposed to look at it and, and uh, read it. The roots of Christianity. What the, the Bible, this is number three on that general information stuff. The Bible is the written record of what God has done to save his people. It's the word of God. And it's the religious interpretation of the Hebrew people of how God was relating to them. The roots of Christianity are found in the scriptures. Sometimes people think that the Catholic Church doesn't have anything to do with the scriptures. Well, our roots, we are Judeo-Christians. Our roots are in the Jewish faith. Jesus was a Jew. He was an Israelite. He was a Hebrew. And he's the one who was promised in the book of Genesis. The Old Testament is not real easy to read. When you look through the Old Testament, of all these 47 books of the Old Testament, it's written at various times, and there are various reasons in which it was written. Some is history, some is uh, poetic stuff, poems, some are the Psalms. You know, a lot of it, we attribute all the Psalms to King David. King David did write all the Psalms, he wrote, wrote one or two. But some of those Psalms were written uh, at the time of the Babylonian exile. How do we know that? Well, one starts, by the streams of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. On the aspens of that land we hung up our harps. Our captors said to us, why don't you sing a song to your God? How can we sing a song to God in a foreign land? If I sing a song, may my tongue be cut out. Because I can't praise God in this situation which I'm in. And, and, then, and some of the psalms are not all filled with great joy and great love. One of my favorite psalms, since we're, we're going to talk about the psalms, we're going to talk about the psalms, is Psalm 109. Page 677. Page 677. I'm using a different one. Well, I'm, for everybody else, it's I'm page 677. Like yours. I'm using a different <laughs> one. We used in. Uh, <laughs> 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 See, the guy that wrote this was having a bad day. I say this every once in a while. I think of certain people, and then I say that. Sometimes. Oh, God, whom I praise, 
Break your silence now that the wicked and the false are both accusing me. They are defaming me, saying malicious things about me, attacking me for no reason. In return for my friendship, they denounced me, although all I had done was pray for them. They pay me back evil for kindness and hatred for friendship. Therefore, give them a venal judge. Find somebody to frame the charge. Let them be tried and found guilty. Let their prayers be construed as a cry. Let his wife, life be cut short. Let someone else take his office. May his children be orphans and his wife a widow. That God really must have praise of God. <laughs> May his children be homeless vagabonds, pounded from their hovels. May the creditor seize their possessions and foreigners swallow their profits. May no one be left to show him a kindness. May no one look after his orphans. May his family die out, his name disappear in one generation. I love this. May the crimes of his fathers be held against him and his mother's sin never be faced. May God bear these constantly in mind to wipe out their memory from the earth. You want to curse somebody? Here. Time to go home and read Psalm 109. <laughs> so the Psalms have all kinds, of, the scripture has all kinds of different things in it. You know, it's not all yippee-i-o, praise Jesus. Uh, number seven on that introduction to scripture. The contents of the books are as follows. Songs, speeches, poems, prayers, proverbs, laws. The, the book of Leviticus has a lot of laws. Tell them the Hebrew, how to, the Hebrews, in terms of their feasts and what they had to do and all that kind of stuff. Um, history, battle cries. These are literary forms. And some of it is historical. The book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations is one of the short books but it describes, it's written by the people who were left in Jerusalem during the Babylonian exile. And they're wandering around amid the death and the rubble. And they're even describing some of the things that are happening. Mothers are um, boiling their children and eating them because there's no food. Historically, that happened. The con okay. The Old Testament is a collection of books produced over a long period of time with different purposes, different levels of importance. Um, some of the earliest parts predate 1000 BC. The Bible is an expression of the religious experience of the people. The Bible is not a scientific book. And so, you know, scientifically, this is not going to happen. One of the prophets, one of the minor prophets, there's three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. There's a number of minor prophets. One of the minor prophets was called by God to be a prophet. And he decided, you know what, I know what happens to prophets. Most of the time they're rejected and a lot of times they're killed. So God calls this guy and tells him to go to Nineveh. And so, I don't know if there's north or south, but he gets on a boat and goes the opposite direction. So, there's this terrible storm. And he's in the bottom of the ship. And the captain of the ship thinks that this boat's going to sink and they're all going to be dead. So he calls all these guys up and he said, did you turn away from God? What did you do? God is in the basement, the hole of the ship. So they drag him up, and they said, look at this storm and all this. Did, are you doing something against your God? He said, well, you know, I'm trying to get away. So they throw him in the water. I flunked biology and was thrown out of the seminary in Detroit for being stupid. I reminded Bishop Mark Ford of that on Friday. Saturday, I told him. He said, one of your predecessors threw me out of the seminary for being stupid. And he was very clever real that. He said, well, I'm glad because now you're here with us. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but, but there was a good comeback. 
But anyway, even though I flunk biology, I know that what's in that story in the scripture can't be exactly true if you take it literally. Because what happens? They throw the prophet out into the water. A big fish comes, swallows him. He's inside the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. And then the whale goes, swims to Nineveh. Smart whale. He swims to Nineveh, gets up real close to the shore, beaches himself, and and here's the old prophet. Then the prophet's mad because he has to prophesy. He prophesies. Everybody in Nineveh changes their ways. The whole place repents in sackcloth and ashes. God doesn't destroy him, and a prophet sits and gets mad at God because he didn't you know, kill them all. If that book is trying to teach science, even as dumb as I am about biology, I know that you cannot exist in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights if the teeth didn't get you on the way in, the digestive juices would. So that's not what the book is talking about. What the book is talking about, if God calls you to be a prophet, then you need to respond and do it. He's going to get his way, and you're not going to get away from him. So just do it. Do his will and do it. The Old Testament is divided into three distinct divisions. History, actual history, stories of war. There are actual recounts in there of battles that took place. Prophets. There are three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then there are a number of minor prophets, Hosea, Isaiah, Baruch. And sometimes they had to do strange things. And they would do these strange things, but God was using them to teach. One of my, one of my favorite Old Testament prophets, the minor prophet, is the prophet Hosea. Hosea is the prophet of God's divine love. And he's told in the book, it's a very short book, and the book starts and he's told to go out and marry a prostitute by the name of Gomer. And he says, you know, gee, I really don't want to do that. And God says, do it. So he goes out into the streets and he finds this gal and he marries her and everybody mocks him for doing that. And then they have three kids. Shehari Ashub, I think that means you are no people of mine. That's a nice name to give a kid. And Lohu Ruhama, you are unloved. And I forget the name of the third one. But anyway, they had these, <laughs> these names of these kids. And then, after they, she has these three kids, she goes out to her former pursuits. She leaves him with the kids and goes back out to the streets. And he's devastated. Hosea is. And God says, now here's what you're going to do. You're going to go find her. You're going to forgive her. You're going to bring her back and beg her to be faithful. Because she is like the people of Israel. I love them. I took them in. I forgave their sins. And they turned away from me again and again and again. And they just don't seem to care. But it's not me who turns away from them. It's they who turn away from me. And I love them. And I will never hate them. And I will never destroy them. So in doing what I'm telling you to do, you're showing by your life the relationship with me. The prophets were not foretellers of the future. The prophets were men who were called by God and used by God to proclaim a message by the way they lived or some particular message that they had from God. Then there's the wisdom literature. 
that's a collective experience of some of the wise, some of the books of, uh, one book is the Book of Wisdom, and then there's some other books that are in that realm. The sacred scripture began as an oral tradition, stories memorized and retold and prayed for some. That's how they passed things on. They didn't necessarily, uh, you know, they didn't write them all down. They, they would tell these stories and they pass them on. I'm going to bring an example of the oral tradition. Inspiration. Is, this, is the sacred scripture inspired by God? We sort of talked about that. One author is man who actually wrote the words. The primary author is God who inspires the human author in terms of what to write and how to express the things in writing. It's like this God. He's trying to talk about how mankind got in trouble because they stopped worshiping God. So he sits down and he, as, as these guys are talking one night outside trying to figure out why they're in this mess that they're in, you know, one guy might say, well, I think because, uh, you know, we just weren't strong enough and we should have stood up against Babylon. And then the other guy said, no, I don't think so. You know what? We didn't keep the covenant. We kept turning away from God. We stopped worshiping him. And then, yeah, you're probably right. And so he begins to write. So God inspires him so that what he writes is true. The importance of the scriptures lies not in the words themselves, but in the message that God is trying to bring forth. Inspiration. God works directly on the human author's mind and will to write. A sacred author was not conscious of being inspired by God. He didn't have a clue about the Holy Spirit. Nobody knew about the Holy Spirit until the coming of Jesus. God's influence on the sacred author did not involve the communication of knowledge. So when this guy sat down to write, God did not say to him, okay, now listen, the earth is not flat. Get a life. The earth is round. You know, in your mind, as you're explaining this thing, it's round. And you know what? We don't create light before we create the sun and the moon. So get it straight and get your act together. God doesn't do that. So the sacred author knew all that he needed to know before he began to write. And where he received his knowledge has nothing to do with inspiration. Inspiration aided the sacred author to make infallible judgments with accuracy, making his mind reflect the mind of God. It was in 1893 that Pope Leo XIII said that God is the author of the sacred scripture, that the Holy Spirit assumed men as instruments of writing that they conceived in their minds and faithfully wrote what they were moved to write by him. They wrote with infallible truth all that God intended and nothing more. Inerrancy means that the scripture is free from error. Well, this is error. But the sacred author isn't trying to teach that. He's trying to teach that God has the power to create and he does and he did. And he keeps us going because creation is this active creation in the beginning and passive creation. Passive creation is keeping us alive and keeping everything going the way it is, otherwise it all crashes and everything else and we're all a mess. When God speaks, he does not lie, nor can he be deceived. Sacred scripture was not written as an encyclopedia of knowledge for its own sake, but as a book containing an account of God's loving, saving activity for his people. God wrote through ancient Hebrews, the more that we know about their habits of mind and speech, the better we shall approach the full meaning of the word of God. And so, when we read the scripture, you've got to know a little bit about the culture of the people who wrote it. It isn't to be taken, and it's kind of interesting too. These the groups who supposedly take, say, you have to accept everything as it is. You have to, you know, God created the, the earth just like this in six days, 24-hour periods. But it's interesting 
when they say this, they come to the New Testament and they come to the Gospel, especially the Gospel of John, when Jesus feeds 5,000 people, 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children, so probably 25,000 people, and they come to find him the next day. And they say, we're looking for you. And he says, the only reason you're looking for me is because I fed you yesterday. Sometime in the near future, I'm going to feed you with a bread that when you eat it, you're never going to be hungry again. And when you drink it, you're never going to be thirsty again. And they said, wow, give us that stuff. And then he says, at least five or six times, he says, the bread that I will give you is my flesh for the life of the world. And the drink that I will give you is my blood. And they say, how can you do that? And then Jesus says, does this bother you? Well, yeah. They're thinking, And so they all walk away. They sure don't take that literally. Now, Jesus was talking symbolically. Don't you think he would have called 25,000 people back? Wouldn't you want to have 25,000 people? Romney or Obama, if he was in a rally and he had 25,000 people, and they all misunderstood him, and they all walked away, I'm sure they called back. I was only kidding. I didn't mean that. You misunderstood what I'm saying. But they knew exactly what he was saying. They knew what memorial meals were because they would celebrate the Passover. The Passover was a memorial meal in which they remembered an event that they left building their pyramids in Egypt and they went into the Promised Land. So Jesus says, don't let the door hit you in the rear end on the way out. He didn't say that because... <laughs> and then he looks at the apostles. And I remember Monsignor Punky, the former pastor of this place, taught scripture at the seminary. And he says, then he says to the apostles, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, Lord, where are we going to go? And that's just this tremendous act of faith. I thought to myself, that's not an act of faith. They were as confused as the rest of them. But they had put so much time into Jesus and they were probably saying, you know, we don't understand this. We don't understand you but you must be who you say you are, and if this is what you say, show us. But it's just interesting to me that they don't, accept, they accept some things, literally, but they sure don't accept that. The rest of this talk about, uh, talks about characteristics of Hebrew religion and uh, what the gods of the Semites were like. And, uh, for example, under this thing where it says the gods of the Semites, um, the religions of the Canaanites and the other Semitic peoples, like their history, was known only by casual uh, allusions in the Old Testament. But it was kind of fun to be a pagan, because you got to do all kind of wild stuff as a pagan. Whereas the Israelite religion, you couldn't really do a lot of wild stuff. And so they were tempted a lot to leave the Israelite faith and leave God and follow these pagans. This is on page four. As followers of Jesus, we're religiously Jews who have added to our acceptance of the Old Testament our belief in the New. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah who fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophets and expectations. Spiritually, as Pope Pius XI observed, we're all Semites, both Jews and Christians, and we find in the Old Testament the roots of our faith. When you look at some of the prophets of the Old Testament, they even describe what's going to happen to the Messiah. If we look at, for example, the book of Isaiah the prophet. I don't know where that is. You can figure it out, but you don't even have to look it up. In Isaiah the prophet, there's four sections in his book. He wrote... 500 years before the coming of Jesus. And it was the idea of the Israelite, the Hebrew people, they 
They wanted a political leader for the, as the Messiah. They thought that the Messiah was going to be a political leader who was going to come and throw out the Roman government or the government that was in charge at the time and that he was going to establish them as the power of the world. And so that's why they wanted this political leader. In Isaiah chapter 42, there are four songs of the suffering servant. Isaiah 42 says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have endowed him with my spirit that he may bring true justice to the nation. He doesn't cry out or shout aloud or make his voice heard in the streets. He doesn't break the crushed reed or quench the wavering flame. Faithfully he brings justice. He will neither waver nor be crushed until true justice is established on the earth. So he's not going to be this big political leader. It's not going to happen. And then the second servant song is in 49. Um, the Lord who formed me in the womb uh, to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to him. It is not enough for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back the survivors of Israel. I will make you the light of the nation so that my salvation will reach out to the ends of the earth. That's the second one. The third one, the Lord has given me a well-trained tongue so that I may know how to reply to the weary. Each morning he waits me to hear, to listen like a disciple. The Lord has opened his ears. For my part, I make no resistance, neither do I turn away. I offer my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who tore my beard. I did not cover my face against insults and spitting. The Lord comes to my help so that I am untouched by the insults. So too I set my face aflame, uh, I set my face like flint, and I know I shall not be put to shame. So the suffering servant, how he's going to be rejected. And then, ours were the suffer. this is 53, ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sufferings he carried. We thought of him as someone punished, struck by God, and brought low. He was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins, on him is the punishment that brings us peace. Through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way. But God, the Father, burdened him with the sins of humanity. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening his mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? He was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down to death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done nothing wrong, and there had been no perjury in his mouth. So it speaks about how the Lord is going to be suffered and rejected. On Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered into the triumphant city of Jerusalem, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised three people from the dead. The daughter of Jairus, the, widow, the son of the widow of Naim, and Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. He goes to the cemetery in Bethany. He used to stay, whenever he went to Jerusalem, he'd stay at the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. He gets word that Lazarus is dead. So he goes to Bethany on his way to Jerusalem and meets Martha and Mary in the cemetery. And they are crying and carrying on. And they say to him, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would never have died. But even now I know that the Lord will give you whatever you wish. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. They say, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. If you live in me and believe in me, even though you die, you will live. Do you believe this? They said, yes. Then he goes over to the tomb. So where's your very Well, right over here. He goes over to the tomb, and he says, go back to stone. And they say, now they just profess that the, they say, no, don't do it. He's been dead four days. It took be a stench. And he said, didn't I tell you that I have the power? So they roll back the stone. Jesus calls loudly, Lazarus, come out. This is the Gospel of John. And Lazarus comes out, John says, wrapped hand and foot, hand to foot in, in, a, in linen cloths, and his face is wrapped in a sheet. 
And Jesus, and they, they, Jesus says, I'm tying him and let him go free. So he calls Lazarus back to life after he's been dead four days. And Lazarus walks out of the tomb because he's wrapped up like a mummy. Jerusalem is two miles from there. And this is on a Friday. It's Friday afternoon. They want to have a big party for Lazarus and Jesus and the apostles. Everybody in the area hears what happened. And they wanted to come and see if it was really true. So they come and they talk with Jesus. They talk with Lazarus. And the next day, Jesus is going to go down to Jerusalem. And he's going to go to the temple. In the city of Jerusalem, the old city, there are a couple of gates. But the one gate is the golden gate that leads into the temple precincts. So as Jesus is coming down this mountain road to enter into the golden gate of the temple, the people who are in the temple area for the Passover feast, which is going to be later that week, have heard what happened the night before. They acknowledge him as the Messiah. They come out and get their palm branches, and they're hailing him as the Messiah as he's coming down from Bethany, and they're saying, all hail king of the Jews, king of the Jews. In Rome at the time, in, in Jerusalem at the time, there was a garrison of only 50 soldiers. These guys hear this crowd coming along and are totally panicked out of their mind because they think that Jesus is going to overtake the government. He's the political messiah that the Jews are wanting. So he comes down, goes into the golden gate of the temple, walks into the temple precincts and is filled with people. The people are all cheered because he's going to take over the government. He walks up to the area where the temple, uh, uh, the sons of the priests are selling animals that have to be purchased so that they can be slaughtered. And it's a feast, so they have to get these animals. And these guys are cheating the poor. So instead of overtaking the government, Jesus turns the money tables, the tables over and starts screaming, my father's house is a house of prayer and you've turned it into a den of thieves. And animals are flying everywhere and falling down and people are thinking, he's supposed to be taking over the government. What the heck is he doing? He's nuts. The chief priests are kind of thinking, okay? And the soldiers are doing the same thing. So then the priests start going around the crowd. He can't be this Messiah. And they'll stop saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Let's crucify God. So the chance of Hosanna to the David start, you know, crucifying him. And so the whole, mood, the whole mood changes. Jesus was not a political Messiah. He came to bring salvation to the world, and he came to reverse what happened through original sin by his passion, death, and resurrection. But the Jews today even think that the, that the Messiah, and this was the, most, this was the most amazing thing I learned in the seminary, in the theology, that they were trying to be liberal, and for the prophet Isaiah, they invited a Jewish rabbi to teach us that. And of course, when we get to the suffering servant songs, everybody wanted an answer and nobody did, so I put up my hand and the rest of them went up God. And I said, Are, aren't these songs pointing to the passion of Jesus? He said, I was waiting for one of you guys to ask that question. We don't believe that. What we believe is not even that the Messiah now is an individual. We used to believe that. And it all makes sense now. We believe that the Messiah is the nation of Israel. And then he said, that's why the Jewish people in the United States, especially there's a large number in Florida and in New York, they send tons of money to Israel so that Israel can grow and be protected. They don't want Iran shooting them all down because what they want is they want to be the ones to whom peace to the whole world comes. And they are ultimately the Messiah. 
it's not going to happen. But that's, and that's what this Jewish record. I thought that made a lot of sense. Because it explains a lot of stuff that's going on over there. I think it's just enough. That's quick. Any questions about this or anything else? Here's your chance before I blow up. <laughs> Any questions about anything that you think is pretty long to turn to the first time? United States, in, the, in, the, in Rome, there are three, there are four churches that are called major basilicas. St. John Lateran, St. Mary Major, um, St. Peter's, and what's the other one? St. Paul. St. Paul outside the wall. Uh, those are four major basilicas. The basilica is a, you know, it's a large building there. Outside and in, inside of Rome, then there are other churches that are designated as minor basilicas. And they're designated as minor basilicas because of their significance, their history, or whatever. In the United States, there are 37 churches that have been designated by Rome as a minor basilica. The reason being that they're a very important church or that something historical happened. And to be a basilica means, it's kind of an honorary title. It's like a, a Monsignor's an honorary title. A Monsignor's like a Kentucky Colonel. In the old days, it sort of meant something out. <laughs> but anyway, so if, in, not probably not yet, but when this is named a minor basilica, what that means is because of the historical significance of this church and because of what is here and in it, and it's all permanent, it becomes not only a church of the Diocese of Rome, I mean of the Diocese of Steubenville, but it's also a church of the Diocese of Rome. One of the main reasons why this would be designated as a basilica is because the first mass in the Northwest Territory was offered in Marietta, downtown at the confluence of the Ohio River and the uh, Muskingum River. Actually, there's a mosaic, uh, there's a, 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 not a mosaic, but a, a painting that's been designed for that side entrance, off, that whole wall, but it's a kind of grand, so we're not going to, what? Yeah. Mural, yeah. But it's 10 grand, so we're not going to deal with that at this point. I'd, get, I'd be up next to him if that happened. And so I, you know, I don't like blood and pain, so I'm not going to do it. But anyway, and because of, of the fact that everything now in the church is permanent. See, before we had the renovation, the altar was nice. It was dark wood. It was very expensive, but it was like a table. They used to have hand, handles Messiah. They blew it out. It wasn't fixed. Um, the tabernacle was on the side on a, on a wooden stand. Now everything is fixed, and we have all kinds of art and statues and all kinds of, and, and there's reasons that all of it is there, and so because of that, if the bishop um, requested it, they would, and you'd have to fill out this long document, and our document is actually it's finished, and it's 87 pages, some in Latin, some in English, all kinds of pictures. And we've been working on it for three years. So when the bishop came, I told him that we been, because that he was ranting and raving about the church. He was very impressed and liked it and all that. So I told him that we've been working on this, Mr. Rome, who did the church, and Monsignor Moroni, and Father Christopher and I, for the past three years. And I said, the document is complete. And Monsignor Moroni, who's from, he's now the rector of a seminary in Boston, but he's also part of a group that examines churches for, to be a basilica. He even wrote a, a letter that the bishop signs and sends 
to the Archbishop of New York. He stamps it and sends it on to the to Rome. Um, and I gave it to him. And he was most impressed and said, we need to do this and he's going to take care of it and all that. So I would bet that out of the February or March it would be named of Basilica. It would be very significant because it would be a place of pilgrimage. You'd probably get bus, buses coming here from you know, the surrounding states and things. We would have masses. It would really even be good for the economy of Marietta because it would stay here and do all that kind of stuff. And it would be a, you know, it would be a, a major achievement for our, the Diocese of Stuttgart. Because if you have a facility of your diocese, it's kind of a big deal. The priests will all hate people. <laughs> That's whatever. And, and, uh, I would no longer be, uh, you know, if I'm still here, I would no longer be the pastor. The Pope technically is the pastor, and I would be the rector of the Basilica. And then there's a couple of things that we have to, we, we would get. One is called a, there'd be a stand in the sanctuary, and it would be, it's called a number of, you know, it looks kind of funny. It's like a beach umbrella. <laughs> it's gold and white, the colors of the Pope. And then there's another some sort of a pole with a bell on it. And you can carry that in a procession on major feasts and Christmas. And the idea of it is that if the Pope comes to his church, which he's not going to do, um, in the procession they bring this bell and then the Pope would walk under this umbrella. But I don't have to worry about that happening. Because I, really, I, I wouldn't be here for it. I can't just go. If I got to call him and told the Pope was coming. Because I got no fewer than that. <laughs> we were at the, at the classes I had on Sunday, I'd, we had that statue from Fatima, and I was telling them that when I was up in Minerva, I was the dean, and there was a neighboring parish, and this, this guy was supposedly having apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the pastor and I had to go down and talk to, talk to the bishop about it, and the bishop shouted. He looks real stern and he says, there's two people a bishop doesn't want in his diocese. One is the Pope and the other is the Blessed Virgin. <laughs> because allegedly he said there's like 2,000 people a day saying they have an apparition and that's just not true. It certainly was not true of this guy. He lived in a compound with three wives and about 17 children. He burned down one of the buildings, and the fire department came, and he was shooting at them. And then so at some point, they were going to arrest him, and somehow he got a helicopter and took off and went to Canada, where I think he was arrested in Canada. For a while, he was there. He was Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the uh, Joan of the Wild story, because I heard that as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, the three days and nights that he was supposedly banished, well, where, you know, how are you supposed to... Well, see, you know, they used, they uh, used those days as a, you know, it was like a, incomplete, so he definitely wasn't dead. Jesus refers to that. And he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the son of man, you know, be buried in the earth for three days and three nights and rise again. So when the author wrote that, he really wasn't given, you know, a story about the biology. What he was doing is he was trying to say that if you're called to be a prophet, you have to be a prophet. And then He's chosen by God, and he, he gives the message that God wants given, and the people repent, and he should have been happy, but instead, he gets angry and starts to sulk, so God, he's, you know, hot, so God grows this gourd plant, or whatever, and with big leaves, and so it, then he sort of simmers down, and he's real calm, because uh, he's got a little bit of shade, and then God zaps him, and he... <laughs> He takes care of it, he sends the worm, and the worm you know, attacks the worm, so the plant dies. So then he's really mad. So God says to him, he said, look, you get all bent on shape, 
because his stupid plan died. You didn't get bent out of shape when you wanted me to destroy thousands of people in this city. So get a life and change your attitude. Some from the Old Testament that they felt one of the ones that you know, like the Protestant Reformation that they threw out. One of the book, and one of the reasons they did that was the Book of Maccabees. One of the reasons they threw that out is because in the Book of Maccabees, there's this terrible battle that takes place. People on both sides are killed in this battle, and Judas Maccabeus, who's the leader of the, you know, the Jewish army looks over this field of all these dead bodies and he calls his servant and he says, I want you to take up a collection. And they collected 2,000 drachmas of silver. I don't know what a drachm of silver is. They collected 2,000 drachmas of silver. And he says, you're to take it to the temple of Jerusalem and have sacrifices for the sins of the dead, because it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they'll be loosed from their sins. Well, Luther got all in our shape of his alive and all that. But he wasn't the only one. Well, no, there were other ones. There, you know, there were other ones. But he was sort of in charge. And see, when you look at some of that other stuff, there was a group, there's, there's some of the books There's the, the Hebrew, the, the books were written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And when you, some of them had uh, the Aramaic and the, and the Hebrew or whatever, the Septuagint and the, whatever the other one is. They didn't, uh, can, if you look at this thing over the can of the script, did you find that one? They used, all right, here it is. Protestant Old Testament is based on the Hebrew canon used by Hebrew-speaking Jews in Palestine. The Catholic Old Testament is based on the Alexandrian, uh, that's the canon used by the Greek-speaking Jews throughout the Mediterranean, and they had more books than, yeah, the other ones had already been, you know, they didn't include them. When they looked at some of the New Testament books, see, there were all kinds of writings, there's even, and there were all kinds of Gospels that kept Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The famous Gospel that was written and excluded is the Gospel of St. Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas was written um, because it was a heresy. It hit the early church, and the heresy said that um, Jesus really was not God as, as a little child. And he, he wasn't God. He didn't know he was God. And he didn't kind of figure that out until his public ministry, and then he wasn't even sure until he got a cross. Well, some pious Jew, in trying to refute that, wrote this account or gospel and hid it so that somebody would find it. And so when the, when the church fathers looked at that, they read, started reading it, and they said, this is not going to happen. One of the stories in there is Jesus is about eight or nine years old. 
and he's outside, and they're all, all these kids are all outside playing. And Mary is in her house, and she hears this confusion. So she comes out, and there's some little kid who's laying dead. And all the other kids are around, the mothers are there, and all that. And Jesus is standing with a smile. And Mary said, what's going on? Well, he cheated, so I struck him dead. He stopped. He can do it. Mary says, you raise him from the dead, and you do it now. Okay. <laughs> now, that holy, pious Jew who wrote that was trying to, the early Christian, was trying to say, you know, even as, as he's born, he's God. Well, he's, he's God, he's not going to strike a little seven-year-old kid because he cheated at a game. So they said, obviously, this is not inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wouldn't inspire this. It's stupid. So that's why the church, you know, looked at those and said, these are the, the books that we feel are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and nothing can be added, and nothing can be taken away. Well, what's so that? I go to my book. Where does that come from? It said, what? The story about the kid. What was that? It was in the Gospel of St. Thomas. In the Gospel of St. Thomas. I was going to let him go, but I was afraid I'd get in trouble. Go right ahead. Yeah, just in time, because it gives me hard questions. Are we done? We're going to pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, our Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of the scriptures to us. Help us recognize your word, and help us to live the truth that is proclaimed in the sacred scripture. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Have a good trip home. Happy birthday. <laughs>